This is uh, Dr. Kelly Burton. I think many of you know who she is, but if you don't, she's a professor on the faculty at uh, Paradise Valley Community College. She is uh, also a fellow for the Clarity Fund, which is a local think tank. And she recently finished her dissertation, which was on Logos and Dialogos, reading Plato's, Plato's Theotetus, is that how you say it? Under the long shadow of Nietzsche or Nietzsche, which do you prefer? I say Nietzsche. I'm American. I say Nietzsche. Um, but I know some German scholars who put their nose down and say it that way. That's all right. You guys can say it how you want. Um, we are the our, our group is Ratio Christi. We're um, putting on this talk and a number of other talks we hope to do this this uh, semester and next semester. Uh, we'll also be having a follow-up meeting here on Thursday in the same room uh, to talk about kind of reactions, thoughts about the discussion. Uh, and also, uh, particularly if, you, if you're not an ASU West student, we also have a, a meeting at a Grand Canyon professor's house on Thursday in the evening. Uh, we have some flyers if you want to get one about uh, uh, that meeting. We'll, we'll also be having a follow-up discussion about this uh, there. So, without further ado, here's Dr. Burton. Thank you. I'd like to welcome you all. Thanks for coming out. Um, I usually like to have just a discussion with everybody, give and take, but I'm actually going to talk for about 45 minutes and then, uh, then we'll have a question and answer period after that. And how, how long we go is up to you. We've got the room scheduled till five, but you know, we, can, we can discuss up until then. Uh, but I do want to start with some questions for you, like a show of hands. And the first question is, who here would like to see equal opportunity for all humans? Equal opportunity for females, equal opportunity for people of color, the LGBTQ community, immigrant communities. Okay, a lot of hands up. So you want to see equal opportunity. Who here is familiar with Nietzsche the philosopher? Okay, who here has actually read Nietzsche's writings? Okay, um, who here knows he's the guy that said God is dead? Okay, so that's, that's what he's famous for. Um, so I was asked to come and give a talk on this topic Nietzsche on the death of God, the transvaluation of values, and social justice. And uh, I thought this was an interesting topic. Um, I should thank ASU West and Ratio Christi for inviting me to give the talk. And Dr. Anderson, who couldn't be here because he's got the flu, but thank you for uh, having this talk, hosting this talk. Um, my, my interest in, in philosophy is public discourse. So this is a good venue for engaging in public discourse and talking about difficult topics. Um, so if you, if you follow along on the uh, outline, again, if you just got here, the website, you can pull it up on your phone, retphi.com, then click on lectures and you'll see the outline. Um, I, I have it, I, I'm just gonna give you the argument in the beginning. And I, I feel like it's kind of controversial and that's good. Maybe it's, maybe it's not something we can defend, but judge after the uh, reasons are given. So here's my argument. Social justice requires that all humans are equal. Okay, think about that for a second. Social justice requires that all humans are equal. And then the second premise, Nietzsche's death of God removes all rational justification for human equality. Okay, think about that. Nietzsche's death of God philosophy is incompatible with social justice. So one must either give up the death of God or give up social justice. Okay, that's what I'm going to argue. You have to see if it's a successful argument or not. All right, but we should probably do some background information. Um, who, is, who is Nietzsche? Um, there are also links I provided. Some of them are just to Wikipedia, so you can take a quick glance at um, some factual information. I didn't want to spend a lot of time on facts, but you can do some um, researching right now. So Friedrich Nietzsche is a German philosopher. His dates are 1844 to 1900. Um, his philosophy in a nutshell, 
which is not very nuanced, but given the context, I think uh, in the question and answer period, we can, we can flesh it out a little bit more. Um, Nietzsche is reacting to German idealism, uh, particularly Hegel, and rationalism. Um, he thought these views of the previous philosophers, particularly German philosophers, were not grounded in reality. Um, in epistemology, he is, he is considered a radical empiricist. All of our knowledge is through the senses. Uh, but this leads to skepticism um, because part of his view is that everything is constantly changing and uh, nothing is permanent. So our senses uh, can't give us knowledge of anything permanent, no permanent being. Um, so this leads to a kind of nihilism, that there is no inherent meaning in anything. Um, this question of nihilism is the question that he spent a lot of time trying to address. Um, we'll talk more about it, but one version he saw happening in his day was that people would, um, if there was no meaning, then they would be self-indulgent. And I don't know, like eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die, and there's no meaning. Um, he kind of didn't want uh, people to go that direction. He thought that was soft. Um, so we'll talk more about his nihilism. In metaphysics, I'm calling his view a radical materialism, as opposed to um, maybe a more moderate view. And I'm saying that because when we look at what he said about the death of God, he is calling some other um, naturalists to be consistent. So he thinks he is very consistent with his own uh, set of assumptions, and he's calling others to be equally consistent. Um, in human nature, he does not think humans are primarily rational. He thinks we're primarily volitional. Uh, the most basic aspect of human nature is the will. So he's going to emphasize the will, and usually we're, we're willing things to satisfy our desires. Um, but not in a, I don't know, not in a sort of self-indulgent, um, epicurean way. And then in ethics, he is going to propose what's called the transvaluation of values. Um, this is a, a positive kind of nihil nihilism. It's a willing out beyond yourself new values. And these new values we'll talk about, it's, it's the opposite of Christianity. So he's going to think that, uh, he's going to talk about Christianity as slave morality. Um, it's a set of rules that uh, people in power um, use to keep others oppressed. And we need to throw off those values and probably the elites of culture need to come up with new values and use the cultural system to push those values out beyond themselves. We'll talk more about that. So he thinks we need to turn Christian values on its head. A little bit of background. Um, he is uh, coming out of Lutheran pietism in Germany. Lutheran, Lutheranism is a, is a branch of Christianity. Protestant Reformation took place in Germany. So he has a lot of um, cultural Christianity in his background. Pietism is like a personal devotion to God that focuses on your devotion, an individual's devotion. So this is probably going to be what he's reacting to when he's rejecting Christianity, part of it. Okay. Um, so that's a little background of who he is. Write down questions. If you, if you want to ask a question, please write it down. Uh, what did he say about the death of God? Now, I gave you, well, I put up here, or if you're looking at your phone, a big quote. And uh, I practiced yesterday on the ethics class, and they said, this is too long. Don't read the whole thing. So I'm going to read parts of it. You can follow along and skim the part that I, I gloss over. But this is called the madman quote. This is where he talks about the death of God most specifically. And it's from the Gay Science, his book. Aphorism 125. I put a link to that, but it's to the whole book. But I thought, hey, a free book. You can, can have a, a link to the free book. Um, so I'm going to read part of it. The Madman. Haven't you heard of that madman who in the bright morning lit a lantern and ran around the marketplace crying incessantly? I'm looking for God. I'm looking for God. Since many of those who did not believe in God were standing around together just then, he caused great laughter. Has he been lost then? Asked one. Did he lose his way like a child? Asked another. Or is he hiding? 
Is he afraid of us? Has he gone to sea, emigrated? So they're kind of mocking, right? The madman jumped into their midst and pierced them with his eyes. Where is God, he cried. I'll tell you, we have killed him, you and I. We are his murderers. But how did we do this? How are we able to drink up the sea? Who gave us the sponge to wipe away the entire horizon? What were we doing when we unchained this earth from its sun? Where is it moving to now? Where are we moving to? Away from all suns? Are we not continu continually falling? and backwards, sidewards, forwards, in all directions? Is there still an up and a down? Aren't we straying as though through an infinite nothing? Think of that, an infinite nothing. Isn't empty space breathing at us? Hasn't it gotten colder? Isn't night and more night coming again and again? Don't lanterns have to be lit in the morning? Do we still hear nothing of the noise of the grave diggers who are burying God? Do we sp still smell nothing of the divine decomposition? Gods, too, decompose. God is dead. God remains dead, and we have killed him. I'm going to skip a little bit. Um, and he kind of claims that we have to be gods now. Do we not ourselves have to become gods merely to appear worthy of it? There was never a greater deed. And whoever is born after us will, on account of this deed, belong to a higher history than all history up to now. Here the madman felt silent and looked again at his listeners, they too were silent and looked at him disconcertedly. Like, what's going on? Finally, he threw his lantern on the ground so that it broke into pieces and went out. I come too early, he said. My time is not yet. And then I'm going to skip a little bit to the end. It is still recounted how on the same day the madman forced his way into several churches and there started singing his Requiem Aeternum Deo. This is like a requiem for the death of God. Led out and called, and called to account, he is said always to have replied nothing but, what then are these churches now if not the tombs and sepulchres of God? All right, so that's the end of the quote. There's a footnote there if you want to look it up later. Um, but this is where he's talking about the death of God. All right, so now we have to figure out what does it mean? What does the death of God mean? What does it mean for us? What does it mean in general? So I have three ways of, of looking at it. Well, maybe two with some subpoints. The first, let's just think about what the text means. As you've looked at it, as I read it, there are two audiences. One is the, the people who don't believe in God, the atheists. Uh, one scholar said this is the atheists and the free thinkers of his day. And the other audience is, are, are the Christians. So he goes to the churches. But the, the bulk of it is... is addressing the atheists of his day, right? What is he saying to them? He's calling them to be consistent. This is, a, I think, a recurrent theme in Nietzsche. If you, if you look at his works, he wants consistency. And if you look at his life, he led his philosophy in a consistent way. Um, so I, I think that he's calling these free thinkers of his day to recognize what happens when you give up belief in God. If God is dead, then so also must be morality. But they're hanging around in the marketplace going on uh, as life is normal, which means they're going on with the morality that they already had from Christianity. So he's kind of saying, hey, do you recognize the implications of the death of God for morality? You haven't gone far enough in your atheism. Um, he also says he comes too early. The madman's I've come too early, you don't realize it. So maybe uh, he's like a prophet, he's seeing, and I think Nietzsche saw this, uh, the implications of the death of God are apocalyptic almost. It's, it's world shattering for cultures that believed in particularly Christianity. Um, he saw it, but the people of his day didn't quite realize the implications. So it's gonna take time for that to be realized. Um, so think about maybe 150 years after Nietzsche. Have we realized the implications of the death of God yet? All right, what does this death of God mean, though? It can't mean he, he killed God or we killed God metaphysically, right? If God is a being, God is um, eternal spirit. You can't kill a spirit. You can't kill an eternal being. So it must be something else. Um, 
It must be that God is dead culturally. He's irrelevant. So think about that. Is God culturally irrelevant for previously, uh, let's say, Christian cultures? United States, Europe. Is God culturally irrelevant? Which means, is he relevant for public life? Here, do we talk about, not like privately, individually, but in your classes, do they talk about um, topics as if God existed? Sociology and God. Or sociology from a perspective that God is a being. So think about that. Have you ever talked about God on this campus? Not like you're with your friends or uh, in a club. I mean, in classes. In a club? All right. What do scholars say about um, this passage that I read? Uh, I picked three. One is uh, Walter Kaufman, who is one of the famous biographers of Nietzsche. Um, there are two others, but uh, as I looked at them, they didn't really say a lot about the death of God and the implications, but Kaufman did. So here's a quote from um, this biographer. Nietzsche prophetically envisages himself as a madman. To have lost God means, means madness. And when mankind will discover that it has lost God, universal madness will break out. Think about that. This apocalyptic sense of dreadful things to come hangs over Nietzsche's thinking like a thundercloud. We have destroyed our own faith in God. There remains only the void. We are falling. Our dignity is gone. Our values are lost. Who is to say what is up and what is down? Okay, so think about that quote. And think about who is to say. The death of God means the loss of human dignity and the loss of values or the previous values. The implications are cultural madness. So think about that. Uh, is that true? Do we see cultural madness after Nietzsche? The second scholar I, I chose is Martin Heidegger, who, uh, if you look at the footnotes, he has an essay called The Question Concerning Technology and Other Eth Essays. In that, that uh, compilation of essays, he has one, I think it's called The Word of Nietzsche and the Death of God, where he's analyzing what did Nietzsche mean? when he talked about the death of God. And I picked a quote from that uh, about nihilism. So nihilism for Nietzsche has a double meaning. On the one hand, it designates the, more, the mere devaluing of the highest values up to now. So that's the negative side. But on the other hand, it also means at the same time, the unconditional counter movement to devaluing. So there's a positive side. There's a negative side to nihilism, which consists in the devaluation of all values, overturning the um, the philosophers and Christianity of the past. And negative nihilism sees the emptiness of the old values of the systems of Plato and Christian theism. This strain of nihilism is carried out to its logical conclusions in deconstruction. That's my claim. I say that the deconstructionists in, in uh, continental philosophy are carrying out this plan of negative nihilism. Deconstruct all the things, all the values that remain in our thinking from Christianity and from Plato and uh, everything between Plato and, and Nietzsche. Um, this strain of nihilism is carried out to its logical conclusions and deconstruction. The positive strain of nihilism sets up a new system of values to replace the old metaphysics of Plato and Christianity. And this is the transvaluation of values, which I mentioned earlier. Positive nihilism is the willing out beyond into the world a new set of values. It is the positive use of force to will onto others new values opposed to the old values. The new values are based upon force and power dynamics. And I say this because for Nietzsche, everything is about force. Forces in nature coming up against each other, producing this phenomenon we observe. Uh, values are just people's forces against other people's, uh, people's values forced against other people's values. So in the cultural sphere, there's forces against each other. And I think if you look around, you, you see that. Um, the, uh, the cake maker and the Supreme Court, force and force, or force Im imposing laws on people. All right, the third scholar I picked is a contemporary philosopher, um, Brian Leader, I believe his last name is Leader. And he, uh, he wrote a paper that's not published uh, called The Death of God and the Death of Morality. And uh, I asked for his permission to use this paper. He, he wanted me to mention it's not published but I left a footnote 
on the bottom of this where you can go and read the paper. And I encourage you to do so. It's, it's very interesting. Um, he's not a fan of Christianity, but he wants to argue that with Nietzsche's death of God, there is no rational justification for objective morality. Morality is dead with God being dead. And so I pulled out part of his argument. Um, so he says, here's an argument. He doesn't think this is true or anything. He's just saying, if Nietzsche's right about God being de dead, then this argument follows. Um, there exists a God. God determines moral value. All human beings have the following property, an immortal soul bestowed by God. This soul is the basis of moral equality because God deems it so. Therefore, all human beings enjoy basic equality. All right, that kind of seems to follow from Nietzsche's, if Nietzsche thought God exists, morality exists, then, then that seems to follow. But then later in his paper says nobody has proven God. He kind of goes into a, um, a critique of the first premise. So he says, maybe this is a valid argument, but, um, but there's not really an argument for the existence of God. And there are maybe valid arguments in support of the conclusion that moral egalitarianism can be vindicated by the existence of God, but we don't really have an argument for God. So we don't have an argument for moral egalitarianism, where moral egalitarianism is the assumption that we're all equally human. Okay, we're all equal and we have some kind of inherent worth, dignity. Um, okay, so I say, let's consider this argument in reverse. What does it look like if God is dead? So here's the reverse. God is dead. God determines moral value. No human beings have an immortal soul bestowed by God. This is the naturalist claim. The soul is the basis of moral equality because God deems it so, but God is dead. Therefore, no human beings enjoy basic equality. Now, that's the one I think it would be nice to see if you have a counter argument to that. Um, and that's not really my argument. That's the reverse of, of Leader's argument. All right, now here's another quote from Brian Leader. The evidence that Nietzsche believes that the death of God implicates the death of morality is overwhelming. But why does Nietzsche believe that? This is Leader. I have argued that the moral egalitarianism that is central to modern morality cannot be defended on any basis other than the supposition that there is an egalitarian God that invests everyone with equal moral worth. Defenders of morality argue that this aspect of morality can be defended without any theistic assumptions, even though, as I have suggested, moral egalitarianism appears to be nothing more than a legacy of Judaism and Christianity. So let's think about that. Nietzsche, in the madman quote, is addressing those free thinkers and atheists who are still holding on to moral egalitarianism in his day. And he's saying, be consistent. You've got to let go of that. Um, and so it seems like this concept of moral egalitarianism, equality for all humans, is a holdover of what Nietzsche would call slave morality. So you've got to get rid of that. These are just Christian values that you're still holding on to. Right? So Nietzsche is not going to be uh, uh, supportive of that. All right, so think about it. See if there's anything you want to raise a question about or disagree with. Write it down. So now I ask, is what Nietzsche said about the death of God true? Is this how reality is? There's a yes and a no here. Um, in his day, yes, um, God had become culturally irrelevant, if that's what we mean by the death of God. Um, think about our day. Is it true now? It seems like, yes, God is kind of culturally irrelevant in our day. Um, religion is privatized. The institution of culture are secularized. Law is secular. Educa education is secular. Politics is secular. The media, secular. What remains? The churches? Well, Nietzsche will just go in there and say, haven't you heard? God's dead. What are you people doing still hanging out here? Oh, just keep it private, right? Okay. Now, here's the relevant question for us, though. Did he prove that there is no God? Does Nietzsche prove that, or does he assume that? No, he doesn't prove it. He assumes it. Um, he doesn't prove that all that exists is natural and material. Um, 
he has no argument for the death of God. It's almost like he says, I like the pre-Socratic philosophers. I like what they were doing. It sounds good to me. Um, I like the contemporary science. It fits well with what I like with the, um, with the, the pre-Socratic philosophers. Maybe it's true. Um, but I don't think, because he, some of you know that this is part of my dissertation, I show that he gives up on the laws of thought as applying to being. So the laws of thought are just um, part of our language, rules for organizing communication, but it's not anything that applies to any reality. So if he gives up that, then he kind of gives up rationality. He has to go with um, will or desire to establish um, his system of belief. So it's probably like, I like this view, but it's not an argument. And I'm not sure you can pick a, a, a view of reality based on desire. That's not going to fly with philosophy, right? Because we can easily say, well, I, I like the other stuff. I like Plato. You like Heraclitus. I like Plato. Now, we're, now we have a battle of forces, right? My Heraclitus is better than your Plato. No, my Plato is better than your Heraclitus. All right. So yes and no on did, he, did what he say about the death of God being true. Um, what are the implications for us in this room if God is dead? Not just in this room, but society. What if God is dead? What does that mean? Let's talk about justice and equality and social justice. So here's a quote from Nietzsche on equality. So you just got to love him sometimes. He's just so good. Um, here's what he says about equality. The doctrine of equality. But there exists no more poisonous poison, for it seems to be preached by justice itself, while it is the termination of justice. It's the end of justice. Equality for equals, inequality for unequals. That would be the true voice of justice and what follows from it. Never make equal what is unequal. So he was good with inequality. He thought it was the way things are, and you shouldn't try to make things equal. He, he's my, what we might call an elitist. You know what an elitist is? He thinks some people are just better than others. And uh, we should probably be willing to sacrifice for the better ones. Now, I didn't say that. He said that. Take, take up your issues with Nietzsche if you don't like that. All right, Nicholas Walterstorff is a contemporary philosopher who writes a book on justice. What's the title? Uh, justice, Rights and Wrongs, 2009. It's a, a well-received uh, book. You should read this book. It's great. Um, but in that book, he defines justice. He says, I think of justice as constituted of rights. A society is just insofar as its members enjoy the goods to which they have a right. And I think of rights as ultimately grounded in what respect for the worth of persons and human beings requires. So notice some of the key words he's using here. Um, worth. So human beings have an intrinsic worth. And they have rights, inherent rights. Those are the things that, that we need to find a grounding for and... Uh, this is going to be the problem for us. The problem becomes, how do we ground rights in the worth of persons apart from God? Inherent rights implies a Judeo-Christian morality, according to Leader's argument. But this morality is dead with the death of God. So what's going to ground rights and worth and dignity? All right, so I'm going to read you um, some possibilities from, from Walter Storff's book. Um, he, he spends almost the whole book, looking at uh, a secular basis or a naturalist basis for rights and justice. And in the end, I don't know, about 340, page 340, he says, there isn't one. There is no secular ethical theory that can ground uh, human um, uh, justice, uh, equality and justice. So here's what he says. He he's, gives us some options. Having examined the best secular ethical theories, Walter Storff shows the inability of any of them to ground human worth and hence equality and rights and justice. He leaves us with four options. I've kind of nicknamed each option. Some of them are better than others in my book. Um, the first one, he says, 
uh, we can continue to hold that there are natural rights inherent to a worth possessed by all human beings and hope that a grounding will turn up. I said, let's call this the tentativeness option. We don't have one now, but maybe in the future they'll find one, okay? Second one, we can continue to hold that there are natural rights inherent to a worth possessed by all human beings and offer a theistic grounding of such rights. That is an account of the relationship on which worth supervenes that makes essential reference to God. I said, let's call this the God's not dead option um, because he's gonna have a big, he, he still has to address Nietzsche's um, uh, claim that God is dead, right? So um, I'm not sure we can just go back to theism or, or Christianity. Third, I think this is the weakest. We can give up on the existence of inherent natural human rights, insist that there are nonetheless inherent natural personal or animal rights, and I say call this the pounding the table option. There are rights. <laughs> That's not an argument, because someone can just say, no, there aren't. Lastly, and this is the one I think Nietzsche would embrace, we can deny that there are any inherent natural rights whatsoever, while nonetheless insisting on the importance of the social practice of according every human being certain rights. I say call this the pragmatic option. And pragmatism is, it works. So um, society saying, yeah, yeah, we have rights works for us. Um, but there are no inherent rights. So the problem becomes this works until the powers that be change social practices. And then they change our rights. So uh, if Nietzsche is, is right about um, those in power having um, the ability to will out beyond themselves uh, their values on the rest of us masses, then human rights now can be the opposite later, right? So um, what do we do? Brian Leder argues that with Nietzsche's death of God comes the death of morality. If there is no objective morality, there is no basis for human equality. Okay, that's not me claiming that. That's, that's another philosopher. And I think he's saying that's not him claiming it. That's Nietzsche claiming it. If there is no basis for human equality, then there could be no justice. And if there can be no justice, there can be no social justice. But remember, at the beginning, everyone wanted social justice. So here's the dilemma for us. If one holds to consistent Nietzschean naturalism, then it is not possible to have social justice. If we want to defend social justice, then it's not possible to hold to consistent naturalism. The two are mutually exclusive and contradictory. But then maybe you want to say, no, 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 I don't hold to Nietzschean naturalism. I hold to moderate naturalism, which is like the free thinkers and atheists of his day. He's just going to say, be consistent. Why not? Um, if you follow the implications, you should not hold to uh, moderate naturalism and still hold on to those values that are Christian values. So that's why I put that. Consistent Nietzschean naturalism is inconsistent with social justice. So what are our options? These, this is now my suggestion. Okay. Um, option one, we can reject social justice and embrace the new values of the ubermensch, the superman, the, the one who wills out beyond himself new values. See if you want to do that. Be an elitist. The Superman, you've heard of the Superman? Seems like some people might want to do that. I'm not sure. Um, option two, return to theism, as Walter Storff suggests. But this might be too much for some people, given the questions that remain, even from Nietzsche's day, about theism, especially Christian theism. A lot of people have questions, unanswered questions. I know this because students ask them in my class. Um, so my advice, if you have questions about Christianity in this room, then check out Ratio Christi. That's what Ben's doing, right? It's a place where you can go and discuss difficult topics, um, particularly connected to Christian theism. Now, here's my option. I think this might be doable. Um, we can return to a public philosophical conversation of metaphysics. We don't talk about metaphysics anymore. Why? Well, with Nietzsche, that was also the beginning of the death of metaphysics. We don't talk about that stuff. Why? Because it's it's not grounded in uh, empiricism. You can't observe it. But I, I just think that even furthers our discussion. Let's talk about empiricism. So let's return to a public philosophical discussion of metaphysics, which discussion was cut short with the pronouncement of the death of God. 
And we can start asking these questions. What reason does Nietzsche and those who follow him give us for endorsing empiricism, skepticism, nihilism, materialism, naturalism, moral relativism, sophistry? Why should we accept those things? Do you have arguments for those? Can we discuss these philosophical assumptions in a civil exchange of reason giving? I think we can. We're doing it right now. Well, you haven't given me your side yet, so maybe you're not going to get uncivil, right? Should we, re re should we revisit the question of the death of God? Think about that. Is this like philosophical certainty God is dead? Or is it an assumption that we could re-examine? Let's look at it. I just got a new book in the mail today. I was so excited. It's like, um, like Christmas for teachers. A uh, book I get to review. Five proofs for the existence of God. Oh, baby. <laughs> Has the death of God been proven? If so, where? I will pay money for this argument for the death of God. I'm offering money all the time, right? $100, show me proof. I mean like a tight, uh, sound argument. Where can we discuss the question about the death of God? What place in the public sphere allows for civil discourse regarding the existence or non-existence of God? Can we do it here? Look, we're doing it. <gasps> Maybe we should just have more of these. All right, now I, I started this website because I kind of think, um, given uh, Nietzsche and what follows, there's an incomplete discussion. Um, we kind of stopped talking about some of the things that Plato and Aristotle talked about. So I'm, I'm calling this thing retrieval philosophy. And it's a movement to return to a Socratic discussion of our basic philosophical assumptions in the areas of epistemology, metaphysics, and ethics. And uh, I want to retrieve some things that were lost from the past. Uh, and if you're in my uh, 101 class and we read the Apology, you can see, what is Socrates doing? Do we do that now? Why not? There's a tradition of how philosophy is done that's sort of been lost. I'd like to see us retrieve that. And uh, then I leave you with this. What can we retrieve from Nietzsche? What is good that we want to keep that Nietzsche, um, that Nietzsche contributed to the, the conversation, the great conversation? So here are some of the things um, that I took. And then I found out on Thursday of last week that there's a book that I have to recommend this to you because it looks great. It looks hilarious. It's called Get Over Yourself, Nietzsche for Our Time. And uh, he's, he's critiquing um, contemporary culture like Twitter storms and safe spaces and so it's almost like let's put Nietzsche in our society and see what he would say uh, as he looks on uh, what's happening now. So here's some things that that book might also um, in endorse, encourage. The first one is boldness. He wants us to be courageous. He wants us to take risks, intellectual risks, risks in your life. It's, I think this is something that's discouraged in our day, right? Take risks. Be bold. Um, have integrity and be consistent. If you pick a philosophy, live it. Um, don't just say it and then not do it. That's what he was critiquing in that Madman account. You guys say this, but you're not living it. So have integrity. And he is a good example of integrity. Um, he lived his philosophy even though it may have uh, broken him. He teaches us to have uh, boldness in critiquing and entertaining alternative ideas. If you disagree with, that, with an idea, find a way to argue against it. Critique it. Um, if, you, if you don't like something, ask yourself, why don't I like this? What reasons do I have for rejecting this? And try to think of what are the logical alternatives. He would encourage us to do that. And then he encouraged independence. Be your own person. He's, he was for the value of life. Live your life. Um, be independent and uh, reject the herd mentality. He thinks most of us are following along the herd. And I kind of think he would be disappointed in a lot of things he, he would see on social media right now. Right? So be independent. All right, with that, I'm going to pause and uh, take a sip of water and see if you have questions. Now you have to be bold and daring. Okay, Victor. Yeah.
I was just wondering, uh, there are, there have been a lot of attempts to try to put, to have provide a naturalistic basis for, for objective moral values. There are a couple of recent ones I wonder if you're familiar with. One's by, uh, someone by the name Larry Arnhart, wrote a book called Darwinian Natural Right. Um, yeah, I think I have heard of that. And then there, and there, there's, a, there's another one that's, I think it's called Robust Ethics or Robust Naturalistic Ethics uh, by a guy named Eric Weilenberg. Okay. But I, I, I do think, but I think the, I, 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 think, I think people say, well, okay, equality works. They ultimately, you know, that, that's why, you know, you know, do we really want to go back on the civil rights movement? We, no, we, we like equality, mm -hmm. therefore, uh, even though it is, even though the metaphysics is shot, uh, I don't know. I mean, it's it, it's 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 so fragile. Though I think our our our, our, our conviction in equality, we can you know, we, we we say we're for it until yeah. something comes along and some pressure comes up. We have some opportunities to take some advantage that we we don't have. And then when that happens, and it is it is true. Well, I I, I can uh, the the pre the. Uh, Declaration I was going to bring that up. What? I, I was going to bring that up. The, the, Declaration. the Declaration of Independence, uh, my version of the Declaration of Independence, as it would have to be done by after God is dead, right. which goes like this. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are evolved equal and are endowed by evolution with certain alien, inalienable rights. Among these rights are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Now you say that, and immediately a laugh track comes on. Right, and, and Nietzsche would, would not even allow us to say we hold these truths to be something. Well, yeah. He's like, no, 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 no. Well, I, and, 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 and evolution up. wouldn't really support that. Yeah. It seems to me that to say that it's self-evident. It's self-evident to who? I mean, there are millions of people right. all over the world who think it's okay to keep <clears throat> slave. Most of the world's history has had slavery, right? Uh, the, the other thing is I, I think they say, well, we, we, we're social creatures, therefore we need equality. But we, we've been social creatures for a long time when we have slavery, when we have highly stratified right. society. Right. Uh, you know, uh, so why now? Yeah, it does seem like if we make the social creatures argument and we're evolved, we'll look at nature. There's, there's hierarchies in, in the animal world. We're just doing what's in our animal nature when we have hierarchies. That's more natural than thinking everyone's equal. equal. So um, some people are the the alpha dog. Some people are the runt. Um. I was going to say, um, to kind of piggyback on his argument, because I was taking notes, and um, I think he's right when it comes to equality. There really is no such thing as equality, but what balances out equality is uh, the idea of intersectionality, that you may be stronger in one area um, than I am, and so that makes us uh, kind of hopes to tip the scales and maybe not. Okay, hope. so if we think of, I don't think the argument here is about um, equal distribution of abilities or gifts or privileges. It's more like there is an inherent worth in all human beings no matter what, that we are equally human and we have dignity on that basis. So if I, uh, if I'm in a vegetative state, I'm still a human being and I have certain rights um, because I'm human. That's what they're trying to ground. Like, how do you get humans are equal? Uh, I see a hand way back there, Jordan. Yeah. Um, so I kind of took some notes like, just on like, the whole thing. Now, I kind of took some notes like, kind of just on like, like, the whole thing, not just like the social part of it. But like, what I wrote down is that. Um, I think God is definitely so prominent in our society, like he's in our schools, like the Pledge of Allegiance, the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag, like under God, it's on our currency, and God we trust, um, and it's relevant to the public life in our day, and I think one can argue God being dead um, because of like Christians who cherry pick their religions, um, but like for the sake of the argument, if God had died metaphysically, that would be impossible because theists claim that God is infinite and everything but culturally um, speaking and metaphor if he had died figuratively in Nietzsche's age um, even if he was brought back uh, you have to give a proof for God uh -huh. and you didn't do that and um, 
the point of Christianity is love, so um, like despite the questionable punishments that Christianity has, why would their morals stop? Because metaphysically he was dead, okay, there's no afterlife, but then you're living this life, you can still do good in this physical world. But if metaphysically he did die, just culturally he did, I don't, I, I don't understand why people would stop practicing his, or practicing their religion with it, because, well, Think about that. If your religion isn't true and it can't provide the meaning that you need, won't you look for something else? It's like that, that time I, I had the religion of the invisible pink unicorn and you guys kept telling me that you can't have something that's invisible and pink, Mrs. Burton. I was like, well, it's true for me. And you're like, yeah, but it doesn't make any sense. And then I had to change. Remember that? I don't think he means he died. I think he means there were these values that uh, Europe had, that, that uh, the United States had. It, wasn't, it was, you know, uh, this argument that culturally people believed in God and God was what formed the values of a large number in society. It was in the legal system, it was in the education, um, it was in, in politics. Um, it's not like that now. That's what the death of God means. Like if I were to, I don't know, say at the beginning of class, all right, let's, let's pray and ask for God's grace and, you know, and uh, really dig into this material, God helping us. You would think I was crazy, right? Or you're like, you're at the wrong school, Mrs. Burton. That's what that other school across town does. And they're, you know, wishful thinking. Uh, Stephanie. What would Nietzsche think of anti-social justice warriors and anti-feminists and like Milo Yiannopoulos and even by extension Donald Trump? Uh, let me think for a second. Those are a lot of different people. Um, I think he might look at the contemporary scene and say, look, I was right. You have these Antifa people and you have these, um, what's on the other side? Nazi people. And they're, they're forces against each other and look at, they're trying to push their values on us and whoever wins out, those are the ones you should follow. I think that's what he would say. Here's force A versus force B trying to push their values out on all of us. And, uh, and if you're looking at that, you're looking at the wrong place. I think you should be looking at, uh, you should be looking, where, where do the values come from? Really, who's educating the politicians? Who's educating the lawyers? Who's educating the people in the media? Who's educating everybody? So probably Nietzsche would look at the university and say, yes, the philosophers of the future are here. But did I just say that? Am I going to get in trouble? Is this on video? <laughs> yes. I thought it was interesting that you were talking about, um, you know, Nietzsche was talking about the death of values from Christianity. And yet, because nature abhors a vacuum, his immediate response to that seems to be, let me give you a new set of values. Yes. And I think that's something that probably these young people don't often see themselves doing. Because <laughs> I've got kids your age that go to school. But um, I see it with their friends, and oftentimes I think they take things from, like you said, the media, the educators, whoever, and they incorporate those ideas, and they think that they're founding something new. But really, what you're doing is just replacing one set of values with another. Yeah. One social, social construct, as you would call religion at times, you know, with another social construct. And really, when you get to Nietzsche, it almost seems like the natural place that he would go, which is a materialistic approach, is that if there isn't any God, there isn't any moral standard, and then therefore you really have nothing to live for or work towards except things that benefit you. Well, not society yeah. necessarily, not but you. Yeah, I think ultimately that's probably where he should go. Um, he does talk about a kind of living that is, I want to say full, a full life, but recognize 
it's, uh, he, okay, he does talk about this myth of the eternal return, live every moment as if it was going to be repeated eternally. Whether he thinks that's true or not is irrelevant. He thinks you've got to live to the fullest right now, and you're going to die, and that's the end of you. So why are we you know, subscribing to this slave morality that tells you don't do this, don't do that, don't touch, don't, you know, and you're like, but yeah, that's all my drives. I got to, you know, engage all my drives. I'm a natural being with drives. So um, he's not going to discourage that kind of living. And then people later after that take it and, and go with it. Yeah. Uh, so um, are you saying that Nietzsche is a hedonist? He isn't. Actually, he, he's kind of... <clears throat> The nihilism that some people went towards was hedonism, self-indulgence. He's, he's not really going to endorse that, although it does seem to be implied. Um, it's more like get and maintain power and, and grow your power. And you may have to deny yourself to do that. He talks about being hard. And it sometimes sounds like a stoicism where you deny your desires to get you know, you've got to work hard to, to get power. Yeah. Um, this is kind of off what we were already talking about. I was just wondering what you think, what would be his view on other religions? So he's like, okay, God is dead, but we're talking about Christianity, and he's like, okay, Christian God is dead. Yeah. But what about this other stuff, all these other religions? Right. You know, would he be like, okay, let's move away from Christianity. What about these other options? Good question. What would Nietzsche think about other religions? This book I recommended about Nietzsche for our day suggests he would be opposed to Islam too um, because of, of this command to submit to Allah. I mean, I think he's going to be opposed to all religions that have rules. He's opposed to, okay, he doesn't think religions are true. He doesn't think any, uh, he thinks all beliefs are social constructs. Humans make them up to keep people in their place. Um, and they help, I guess philosophers do this too. They help us maintain order. Um, so religions may help to maintain order, but they're not true. And they forget, those who made them up forget that they're not true. And then they talk about them as if they're true. And then the morality is, is telling you, don't do this, don't do that, don't do this. And that's the part that he's saying, you need to get rid of that. So any religion that has morality, which is all of them, um, he would say that's, that's herd mentality, that's slave mentality, that's what you want to get rid of. So yeah, he's not for religion. Um, Victor? Uh, in materialism, a, a social construct on his own view? Wow. I that's mean, that's I, what I'm I, asking. I mean, I mean, he's already critiqued this idea of a world of, right. of true being, right. as if, you know, the way the world really is, right. you know, seen, which is a bedrock of you know, Dawkins type naturalism and say that the world is really the way the scientist says it is. And I don't think there's any room for that. There, he has nothing. He just assumes it. And here's a funny thing. Um, Brian Leader in his paper says Nietzsche would be opposed to Dawkins because Dawkins still is holding on to certain, um, certain values that can't be supported by his naturalism. So the free thinkers and the atheists in that madman quote would include Dawkins. I thought that was hilarious. Um, so you said that uh, Nietzsche liked the science where it was going in his day. Yeah. So I was wondering if Darwin influenced him or vice versa. Okay, good question. Um, Darwin, Marx, Nietzsche, Freud. Freud's a little bit later, but they're kind of contemporaries. And I don't think Nietzsche knew Darwin, but he knew of his work. And he <laughs> thought Darwin was, he was like, no, no, no. I like this idea of evolution, but no, no, no. You still have forms, and you still are talking about things as if they're beings. There's no beings. There's no thing. So evolution is this interesting idea, but there's no uh, thing that can evolve into another thing. That, the things are, are, are imposing on, on what we observe. So he kind of would say, Nietzsche, let me give you this madman thing. You've got to become more consistent. No, uh, Darwin. You need to become more consistent. I mean, he's really going to, he's a cr critic of everybody. Let's just say that. And the consistency that drives him is his, his, his kids watch G.K. Chesterton's the infinite symbol that, you know, that it just, just keeps going on and on. Uh, the serpent eating its own tail. Yeah. 
Yeah, incidentally, he did die of madness. And uh, the popular story is that, oh, he got syphilis and went, went mad from syphilis. But I read some accounts that said, no, those were, um, those were anti-Nazi uh, uh, critics of Nietzsche. Because um, the Nazis kind of picked up on Nietzsche's ubermensch superman and, and kind of said, he's our guy. So not, Nietzsche becomes sort of the poster child for Nazism, even though he was anti anti-Semitic. Um, so there's a long story about that, but I guess one of these um, anti-Nazis was like, he died of syphilis because he was sleeping with prostitutes. Um, but people later have looked at his diaries, looked at some of the, um, I guess there's still medical uh, records on him and said, no, he probably died of a brain tumor uh, and he had dementia for about 10 years before he, um, he got pneumonia and died. So um, the question is though, this dementia, I looked at his um, journals and he started to say some really crazy things towards the end of his life. Like he would sign his letters, the Antichrist. Yours, the Antichrist. And uh, one letter to his friend said, today I cross the Rubicon. And that was the day he snapped. So it looks like he may have intentionally, because of his philosophy, I think he was living it. And, and I argued in my dissertation that he, uh, he gave up reason. And in his giving up reason, he gave up the tools for making sense of anything. And that's what drove him mad. And so when he crossed the Rubicon, that was him saying, I'm going past the point of no return. And uh, there's an account a few days later, he was walking in town and uh, he saw a horse being beaten. This is almost like a scene from uh, Crime and Punishment. His horse is being beaten and he runs up to save the horse. And uh, he just like collapses. And I don't know if it's out of sorrow or physical collapse, but he collapses. And after that, his friends have to come collect him up and, and take him to try to get him to regain his... Uh, sanity, and he, and he doesn't regain his sanity after that. So there, there are talks about, um, discussions about what made him crazy. I think it was him living consistently with his break with reason. That's what I argue in my dissertation. Dr. question? Yeah. So uh, I think one, one possible response might be to say that, um, that this sort of point has been has been made before about kind of, like Dostoevsky can kind of make the point that uh, atheism, materialism carried out consistently will destroy ethics. Mm -hmm. uh, but it could also be said, that doesn't mean that God exists, because maybe just, True. maybe just there's no meaning. True. Um, and I think, a lot, I think a lot of people have tried to make the point that God exists because materialism leads to no meaning. Right, right. There is this, um, way of trying to prove God through the moral argument. Um, I, exactly. I'm, I wouldn't do that. I wouldn't do that. No, I would just say this. Um, the reason I, I thought this was an interesting discussion is because many students are for social justice. That's why I asked you, right? You saw the hands. I'm for social justice. But my experience is also that many students are naturalists. My point is that you can't have your Nietzsche and your, natural, or, or, and your social justice too. You gotta pick one or the other. And if you want social justice, you might need to find uh, uh, a stronger grounding for social justice. And uh, Walter Storff was saying uh, theism. I'm saying, let's just have a conversation about that. I, I'd rather just, let's uh, return to public philosophy. Let's have forums and discuss this stuff. Can we ask uh, uh, whether anybody's got a good argument for God. Would you be interested in that? What if someone's like, yeah, I think I've got a proof for God. Would you be interested in that? What if they did? Then what? Oh, no. Then we have a, a big thing, a big, big deal to, to answer to, right? Um, this month is the 500th year of the uh, Protestant Reformation. Here's, here's the end of it. This is what's come of the Reformation. Is it... So it seems like we can have a great conversation. 
Um, and so that's what I'm inviting you to. Let's, have a, let's, let's not close the door on the question. Let's open the door. You should be kicking the door down, demanding, you believe in God, why? Does that, does that answer your question? Yeah. Uh, can I ask one follow-up? Yeah. Uh, what if somebody said, well, we, uh, Nietzsche, Nietzsche says you, you just kind of have to pick your thing and just kind of go with it with force. Mm -hmm. What if we pick social justice and just drive that home? Um, but let's not call it social justice. Let's just call it uh, the thing I picked that I'm going to drive home with force. Don't call it justice. <laughs> Deep in. Okay, so um, I'm wondering like, his reaction. Let's say like religion was brought back to the public. I don't know if this will happen. I kind of doubt it. But if it was... You know, it was a public thing. It was part of you know every person's life, public, private, and everything like that. You know, would he start if he's so anti-religion? Would he go from God is dead to we should kill God? Probably. Why not? But I'd say, come, let's join the discussion. Tell us why. Uh, incidentally, I'm in, just inviting a public discussion about the question. Maybe it turns out, nah. God really is dead. Let's, let's move on. And if we did move on, it would be purely pragmatism. It would just be what works. And usually it's what works to make the most people satisfied. And by satisfied, I mean like physically satisfied. Like we're not in pain. Some people have more pleasure than others, but, you know, not everybody's in pain. The greatest amount of Pleasure for the greatest number of people. Is that what you want? Stephanie? What would Nietzsche think of collectivism? He hates it. Collectivism. Be like, what's going on? What's wrong with you people? Nobody is like the ruler. Do you think <coughs> social justice is more based in collectivism then? Um, or if you don't want to use the term. You, okay, I, I, I'm going to be honest. I am not an expert on social justice, and what I do know, I've learned from most of my students. It's a new thing to me, social justice. So my understanding, though, is social justice has roots in Marxism, um, and, and Marxism is uh, a materialist view, so there, there's, there's going to be tension. That's kind of why I'm saying, hey, um, materialism and social justice, I don't know, do they really go together? Then if it doesn't have social justice and materialism, then what would social justice use? Because a lot of social justice is not inherently anti-religion, but it's not. I know, that's kind of what I'm saying. That's, that's exactly the question. If it's not naturalism, then what? Ron? What is your understanding of social justice? I don't, I don't know. I don't know. I'm going to be honest. I, I claim second-hand knowledge on this. What, do you have an understanding of social justice? Um, no, I, I see it as a, what's the difference between justice and just justice being just? It's well, that, you know, I, I think uh, in reading Walter Storff's book, he's just going to say, there's this thing, justice. And um, my understanding is there's um, different kinds of justice. There's distributive justice. And I think social justice is connected to distributive justice, equal distribution of goods. That's, that's going to be, I think, rooted in Marxism. So distributive justice, contractual justice, we make contracts, somebody breaks it, we go to court to get um, our just due. And then there's uh, retributive justice, retribution. Um, you committed a crime, we want this, this shooter, we want justice. Um, he's dead already, right? How are we going to get justice? So retributive justice can't, can't really happen there. Um, and then I think there's uh, something else uh, where there are communities that are broken and uh, you want to bring them back together. Um, I'm, the name is escaping me. Come on. What's this justice, Don? Restorative. Who said that? Thank you. Restorative justice. You want to you wanna bring communities back together. Like uh, the Truth and Reconciliation Committees in South Africa that try to bring these, these uh, warring communities that killed each other, they have to live together now. How do you 
So you want to bring restoration to that community. Um, so there's different kinds of justice. I think, and I could be wrong, that social justice is connected to distribution, distributive justice. And we might say, hey, there's this thing called privilege. Some people have it, some people don't. Some are more privileged than others. And it's usually connected to our, our opportunities and the things that we have that we don't really notice. Um, but the thing is, I want to know, and this may be controversial, and I'm just going to plead ignorance, it seems like we do have, if there's equality, we do have equal distribution of one thing. And if you know me, you'll know what it is. What's the one thing everyone equally has? The capacity to use reason, <laughs> right? <laughs> the exercise, maybe not. Stephanie. Um, I would argue that a lot of the social justice doesn't argue, argue for Marxism like type of quality. I know a lot of it, some of it does. Some of it is more communist -y. But like a lot of it is also, if you are currently privileged, then you should be less privileged, and the person who isn't privileged should be more privileged than you. So instead of going like this to this, it wants to go from like this to this. If that makes sense. Okay. okay. I guess um, this is an area to me that feels um, like it's still emerging. And I haven't, because I was working on another project, haven't had the time to read up on, you know, the roots of social justice. Um, I did actually read a little bit. You're not going to like what I found. Guess where social justice started? Christianity. Oh, no. Um, Bartolome de las Casas in the 1500s argued that Native Americans were equally human to the Spaniards who were oppressing them and he made these really strong arguments on the basis of natural law and and Christianity that this is wrong these are equally human you can't do this that's the roots, roots of social justice it might go back further uh, but I I like de las casas so I uh, I like the way he argues and so that, that's um, that's part of it so did social justice just spring up from nowhere? I think it, if you dig deep, it's got, it's got roots in Christianity. In America, it, it, it came through a lot of, of women's movements that came out of churches. Um, actually, that there were these women's organizations that came out of churches that, that worked for particular social justice causes, such as abolitionism, yeah. and that's how you got Seneca Falls, and that's how that's how you got a lot a lot of the a lot of the social justice movements through the 19th century uh, basically were grounded in churches, but in particular women's auxiliaries from those churches. Okay, this is this is reminding me of the social gospel too. Yeah. So if you do some research, maybe you'll find ah oh, social justice has got roots in Christianity. Pick you back on the gentleman's question. Um, have you seen a change in the direction or type of social justice from women's rights to current? Uh, has the value system changed or the goals changed? Or do you think it's on the same continuum? That's a good question. Um, it seems to me that starting with the Declaration, uh, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal and are endowed by the Creator of certain inalienable rights, that that, that statement was about all humans, but in the United States we hadn't seen it applied to all humans. And so I think people are arguing that the social justice movement is trying to see that applied to all people groups. Um, maybe it started with um, uh, women getting the vote, the end of slavery, and now it's like, let's apply that to marriage equality, um, Let's apply it to transgender rights and that kind of thing. So I think they think they're taking that ideal and pushing it to the next logical conclusion. Does that make sense? I, I, I don't, this is my, my observation. I could be wrong. Do you see any fundamental differences in, um, I guess, the equal application? I mean, is there, because my limited understanding is that they seem to also have some issues with freedom of speech, which... Okay, yeah, um, I, don't, I don't even know how to get into that topic. Um, 
freedom of speech. I am giving a talk on this on October 17th at PVCC. It's our chat in the grass. Come join us. Um, but what I'm just going to do is say, what is freedom? What is speech? What is free speech? And uh, is that what people are currently understanding free speech to be? And because uh, we have this, um, uh, I guess he's a street preacher that comes on our campus and he says some outrageous things. Don't talk about it. Don't give him any attention. He says some outrageous things. And students are like, well, some of them are saying, well, we don't think he should have the right to say those things. And other students are like, no, but he has freedom. And so that's what's sparking our discussion. Um, so I'm going to use him as an example. So I I'll invite you to come to that talk. Yes, right here. Um, well, first of all, does anyone have anything to piggyback off of the previous questions? Because I have some I have a different thing. OK. Um, well, just a basic, um, how do you think a Nishi would, um, how do you think he would interpret, like, in what direction would he go about treating the people who have, who are, who, like, currently suffer from, like, a mental, like, dis a mental disability from birth? Like, because, you know, you know, you talk about like the ubermensch and yeah. like, you know, um, higher, hierarchy and then versus, you know, all men are created equal. You know, what about those guys? You know, yeah. See, um, I'm not sure what he would say because. You don't have to like censor yourself or anything. No, I'm honestly, I can't, I'm looking through my catalog of quotes that I've read. When I did my dissertation, I focused on what did he say about reason all of his works, but I, there were things I didn't get to study, like what is this Ubermensch really? And what are the implications? Like, does that mean we, uh, the, the strong should like, eliminate the weak? That's the way the Nazis took it. And it seems like that could be a consistent reading, but he also was anti-anti-Semitic. On what basis, I'm not sure. So it seems like this is, would be an interesting area for study. Future dissertation, should take it and run with it. Yeah, I don't know. I, I, I think if he was being consistent, it does seem like the Nazi solution is, would, would not be inconsistent with his view. But, you know. Yeah, there it is. That's my answer, uncomfortable as it is. Stephanie? I would argue that modern day feminism and modern day social justice didn't start until 2012 in the presidential election back in 2012 because that's when the LGBT thing basically, I think 2012 is the year that it took off. That's the year that it became a winning issue. And I would argue that that has sprung forth this new age of the new third wave feminism and the new social justice. All right, dissertation topic for you. Um, I'm going to be honest. My head has been in the books for at least the last three years, if not ten years. So, like I'm saying, this social justice awareness consciousness thing that's happening, uh, I am I'm learning about it still. And uh, when you say the election of 2012, I'm thinking, what happened then? <laughs> Hmm, where was I? So I, I guess what I'm asking is if you want to educate me on this, bring me some books. Free ones. <laughs> <laughs> or point me to some resources online. I, I'm asking, yeah, this is why I do this, so I learn new things. So I'm willing to be educated on social justice. Jordan? Um, earlier you said infinite nothing. Loudly. Earlier you said infinite nothing, and you said to keep that in mind. Yeah. So I was just wondering. What it was infinite nothingness. It's like, it's like, there is no thing. So remember, we talk about nothing is eternal, can't be. It sounds like he's talking about that. There is no thing anywhere. There's no permanent being. He doesn't think that. There's no permanent being. It's almost, almost like Buddhism. Did you ask me about Buddhism? No. Someone else asked me about Buddhism. Am I going to address Buddhism? No. Here's why. Um, Nietzsche is like Buddhism without the rules. He'd be like, Buddhism, that's nice, except get rid of those, um, uh, the eightfold, fourfold path and the, the four noble truths and the eightfold path. Yeah. 
And if you were in my world religions class where we were asking which religion is the easiest, I think we discussed this and we thought, Buddhism is the hardest. That one's super hard. So uh, Nietzsche would be like, no. Yeah, yeah, ever try killing desire? That, well, don't. No. <laughs> Bud Buddhism, Nietzsche, and opposite. Yeah. He's willed to power, and he and 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 Buddha's saying kill that. So. Yeah. Exactly. So Nietzsche would be like, yes on the flux thing, no on the ethics. So. All right. Should we wrap things up? Do you want to announce anything or anything else? Uh, well, a couple things. So, one, we're going to have a we're going to have another talk here next month that'll be on the problem of evil. Uh, we'll be a professor from Arizona Christian, Greg Malloy, will be able to talk about that. Uh, also, I mentioned before we'll have a follow up discussion on this uh, on Thursday at 1:30 in here. So, if you want to come and be part of that. Uh, also, Thursday night we'll be talking about uh, some of the same stuff with God and ethics and kind of. How does, that, how does that tie in? Uh, we have a, a flyer about that here. If anybody is interested in coming to that, that's off campus. That's going to be combined with uh, Grand Canyon and some of the students from there. Um, that'll be at the professor's house. Um, and uh, let's just give Dr. Birch a I add one more? Don't. Okay, one more, and then we're going to clap for you. Since you're all here, you're invited to the big 30 years of philosophy bash at PVCC, October 24th, it's a Tuesday, from 6 o'clock to 8 o'clock in the big KSC building in the front room of KSC 1000. And uh, if you were a student at PVCC or a friend of a student, or if you know Professor Ganganine and were a student of his, you are invited. We are going to have a panel discussion uh, between four of us who, who studied at PVCC and became philosophy teachers. And then we're inviting our old teacher, Mr. Ganganine, back, Dr. Ganganine, back to give a talk. And if you didn't have the experience of having him as a teacher, he's like the best. And he will come and ask you oral quiz questions. So you're invited to that. Okay, now. Okay. Well, we can Thank finish. you, Dr. Burton. Thank you.